Hello everyone. Today we continue our reading of Book 4 or Lieber Abba by Aleister Crowley. And of course this is his magical layman. Okay, Book 4. Okay. And this is again is one of those great occult classics. 800 and something pages. <laughs> And yet we've undertaken to read it together, okay? I'm going to provide a commissioned link for those that want to buy a copy. And uh, if you do that using my link, you don't have to, but if you do, I do get a commission. Helps to monetize my content. Um, and by the way, I just made a video for Patreon only. So if you are a Patreon subscriber, right before this video, I did like a 32-minute lecture on my tarot course for Patreon. So anyways, today we are reading chapter 5, Durana. Chapter 5, so book 4, part 1, Mysticism, chapter 5, Durana. Now that we have learnt to observe the mind so that we know how it works to some extent, and have begun to understand the elements of control, uh, we may try the result of gathering together all the powers of the mind and attempting to focus them on a single point. We know that it is fairly easy for the ordinary, um, educated mind to think without much distraction, on a subject in which it is much interested. We have the popular phrase um, revolving a thing in the mind, and as long as the subject is sufficiently complex, as long as thoughts pass freely, there is no great difficulty. So long as a gyroscope is in motion, it remains motionless relatively to its support, and even resists attempts to distract it. When it stops, it falls from that position. If the earth ceased to spin around the sun, it would at once fall into the sun. Okay. <clears throat> the moment, then, that the student takes a simple subject, or rather a simple object, and imagines it, or visualizes it, he will find that it is not so much his creature as he supposed. Other thoughts will invade the mind, so that the object is altogether forgotten, perhaps for whole minutes at a time, and at other times the object itself will begin to play all sorts of tricks. Suppose you have chosen a white cross. So you're visualizing a white, this is talking about like you're visualizing a white cross just as a symbol. You're doing a, a visual, you're focusing on this one object, mental and uh, meditation. Suppose you've chosen a white cross. It will move its bar up and down, elongate the bar, turn the bar oblique, get its arms unequal, turn upside down, grow branches, get a crack around it or figure upon it. Change its shape altogether, like an amoeba. Change its size and distance as a whole. Change the degree of its illumination. And at the same time, change its color. It will get splotchy and blotchy. Grow patterns. Rise, fall, twist, and turn. Clouds will pass over its face. There is no conceivable change of which it is incapable. Not to mention its total disappearance and replacement by something altogether different. And those of you that have practiced meditation <laughs> know what it's talking about here. Anyone to whom this experience does not occur need not imagine that he is meditating. It shows merely that he is incapable of concentrating his mind in the very smallest degree. Perhaps a student may go for several days before discovering that he is not meditating. When he does, the obstinacy of the object will infuriate him. And it is only now that his real troubles will begin. Only now that will comes really into play. Only now his manhood is tested. If it were not for the will development which he got in the conquest of Asana, he would probably give up. 
as it is the mere physical agony which he underwent is the veriest trifle compared with the horrid tedium of Durana. For the first week of your meditation practice, it may seem rather amusing, and you may even imagine you are progressing. But as, you pra as the practice teaches you what you are doing, you will apparently get worse and worse. Please understand that in doing this practice, this meditation practice, you are supposed to be seated in asana, and to have notebook and pencil by your side, and a watch in front of you. You are not to practice at first for more than ten minutes at a time, so as to avoid risk of overtiring the brain. In fact, you will probably find that the whole of your willpower is not equal to keeping to a subject at all for so long as three minutes, or even apparently concentrating on it for so long as three seconds or three-fifths of one second. By keeping to it all is meant the mere attempt to keep to it. The mind becomes so fatigued and the object so incredibly loathsome that it is useless to continue for the time being. Frauder P.'s record, we find that there that after daily practice for six months, meditations of four minutes and less are still being recorded. The student is supposed to count the number of times that his thought wanders. This he can do on his fingers or on a string of beads. Okay. If these breaks seem to become uh, more frequent instead of less frequent, the student must not be discouraged. This is partially caused by his increased accuracy of observation. In exactly the same way, the introduction of vaccination resulted in an apparent increase in the number of cases of smallpox, the reason being that people began to tell the truth about the disease instead of faking. Okay, now a footnote talking about the, the meditation beads like I showed mine over here. This counting can easily become quite mechanical. With the thought that reminds you of a break, associate the notion of counting. The grosser kind of break can be detected by another person. It is accompanied with the flickering of the eyelid and can be seen by him. With practice, he could detect even very small breaks. Okay, that's the end of the footnote. Soon, however, the control will improve faster than the observation. When this occurs, the improvement will become apparent in the record. Any variation will probably be due to accidental circumstances. For example, one, might, one night you may be very tired when you start. Another night you may have he headache or indigestion. You will do well to avoid practicing at such times. We will suppose then that you have reached the stage when your average practice on one subject is about half an hour, and the average number of breaks between 10 and 20. One would suppose that this implied that during the periods between the breaks one was really concentrated, but this is not the case. The mind is flickering, although imperceptibly. However, there may be sufficient real steadiness, even at this early stage, to cause some very striking phenomena of which the most marked is one which will possibly make you think that you have gone to sleep. Or it may seem quite inexplicable, and in any case will disgust you with yourself. You will completely forget who you are, what you are, and what you are doing. A similar phenomenon sometimes happens when one is half awake in the morning, and one cannot think what town one is living in. The similarity of these two things is rather significant. It suggests that what is really happening is that you are waking up from the sleep which men call waking. The sleep whose dreams are life. There is another way to test one's progress in this practice, and that is by the character of the breaks. Breaks are classed as follows. 
Firstly, physical sensations. These should have been overcome by asana. Secondly, breaks that seem to be dictated by events immediately preceding the meditation. Their activity becomes tremendous. Only by this practice does one understand how much is really observed by the senses without the mind becoming conscious of it. Thirdly, there is a class of breaks partaking of the nature of reverie or daydreams. These are very insidious. One may go on for a long time without realizing that one has wandered at all. Fourthly, we get a very high class of break, which is a sort of aberration of the control itself. You think, how well am I doing it? Or perhaps it would be rather a good idea if you were on a desert island, or if you were in a soundproof house, or if you were sitting by a waterfall, but these are only trifling variations from the vigilance itself. A fifth class of breaks seems to have no discoverable source in the mind. Such may even take the form of actual hallucination, usually auditory. Of course, such hallucinations are infrequent and are recognized for what they are. Otherwise, the student had better see his doctor. The usual kind consists of odd sentences or fragments of sentences, which are heard quite distinctly in a recognizable human voice, not the student's own voice or that of anyone he knows. A similar phenomenon is observed by, a wire, by wireless operators who cut, call such messages atmospherics. There is a further kind of break, which is the desired result itself. It must be dealt with later in detail. Now, there is a real, now there is a real sequence in these classes of breaks. As control improves, the percentage of primaries and secondaries will diminish, even though the total number of breaks in a meditation remains stationary. By the time that you are meditating two or three hours a day, and filling up most of the rest of the day with other practices designed to assist, when nearly every time something or other happens and there is constantly a feeling of being on the brink of something pretty big, one may expect to proceed to the next stage, dhyana. Okay, and that is the end of chapter 6, dharana. Once again, of uh, part 1 of book 4, Liber ABA or Liber ABBA. I highly recommend this book. This is one of those great occult classics. Okay, and um, it deals with the four um, aspects. Okay, mysticism, uh, yoga. So you, you hear a lot about yoga. So that's the end of that. Um, but uh, yeah, it talks about yoga, meditation, asana, the eight limbs of yoga or ashtanga yoga, the eight limbs. And um, yep, so that was talking about dharana, concentrating the mind. And, uh, and I'll see y'all in the next chapter tomorrow or this evening. Um, I just wanted to announce on my Patreon, I did um, a tarot video, and uh, I talked about the back, the back of these, the Hermetic Rose Cross, and what this means. So, and uh, I'm going to continue making these videos, so that was for Patreon only, and um, so, yep. And uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to explain, though, right now, there's not a whole lot on there. <laughs> there's like five Patreon videos or something. Um, I do, I am building uh, some, I am putting a lot of videos out there on this course. Most of them have been for everyone, um, you know, trying to hype up this course. But um, today I did one of my Patreon-only videos. And uh, I really do appreciate those that support my channel so that I can put all of my focus in making content like this. So I can just put all of my focus and, and talking about magic and doing this type of thing. So I really appreciate those of you that support my Patreon. 
And, uh, yep, that is it for now, and I will see y'all in the next video. Thank you so much for tuning in. I really appreciate each and every one of you for taking the, the time to, to spend with me and to explore these great occult classics and to work through all of this. So I will see y'all in the next video. Have a great day, y'all.